Welcome to CAF Warbird Tube, a show where we talk about warbirds, history, World War II, flying, and much more. This show is supported by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. This nonprofit membership organization has preserved and flown historic aircraft for more than 65 years. CAF's mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. And you can join this organization in support through your donations, membership, or by volunteering your time and talents. Visit commemorativeairforce.org for more information. Good evening. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and welcome to everybody watching tonight on Facebook, YouTube, and those of you watching on GoToMeeting. We're glad to have you with us. If you would, if you haven't already done so, please take a second to like or share. And uh, if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. And if you do subscribe, also hit the little bell next to it so that you get notifications when uh, we go live. So uh, however you do it, you'll be the first to know when we go live and when new episodes are up on CAF Media. Now, as you watch the presentation tonight, you might have some questions. Just type them in the comments section, and we'll try to answer them either during the presentation or before we sign off. Now, on this episode, we're going to take a look back 80 years at one of the most decisive naval engagements in history, the Battle of Midway. And joining us tonight is Chris Kolakowski, who is the director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in Madison. Chris, welcome back to the show. Steve, thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's always great to work with the Commemorative Air Force. Um, I actually have my member pin on. I'm a supporter of this organization. Uh, you guys do great work keeping the memories alive and keeping the warbirds flying. And it's just, uh, I, I'm happy, happy to be working with you again. All right, thank uh, what you. We're gonna, what, thank you. What we're going to be doing this evening, folks, is we're going to be spending our time looking at, uh, Steve mentioned, one of the great naval battles in the history of the world. Battle of Midway in 1942, which was fought 80 years ago, actually this past weekend, from June 3rd to June 7th of 1942. If you get no, if you get nothing else out of this presentation, I want you to walk away with these two key points here. So you can see the dates of the battle. It was a key point in the Pacific War, the World War II, and it was one of the great naval victories in U.S. and world history. The leadership made the difference in this battle with a little bit of luck. And I'll add a corollary to this, is whenever you think about naval warfare or sea stories or anything like that, always remember that the great sea stories, like the one we're going to talk about tonight, ultimately turn on the human factor. And that's something that should be borne in mind. But those are the key points um, we're going to look at here this evening. Um, here's what we're going to do, just a quick, quick agenda of what we're going to be covering. I'm um, going to give you kind of an overview why Midway? Why do they, the United States and the Japanese end up fighting for this island? We're going to look in detail at some of the forces and the plans, of course, the battle itself, and then time permitting, uh, some reflections on the aftermath and what it all, what it all means and some of the impact of it. So with that, let's get going. And the first thing it's always a good idea to start with is a good map. Um, and it's a map, obviously, of the Pacific Theater in 1941 at the beginning of World War II. And I will quickly orient you here on the map. Up here to the north, north being at the top, up here to the northwest, you see North America, which is Alaska, Canada, of course, the continental United States. Coming across the north end of the map is the Soviet Union, which today is Russia, China, right here on the mainland of Asia, India, Burma, which were both British colonies at the time, British Malaya right here, Indonesia, which at the time was a Dutch colony known as the Dutch East Indies, French Indochina, which is Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia today, the Philippine Islands, Taiwan just to the north of it here, and the South China Sea, which of course has been in the news of late. Directly north of there is Korea and Japan. You can see those right here where I'm tracing my cursor. And then if you come east of Indonesia, you've got New Guinea, Australia, the Solomon Islands where I'm circling with my cursor, and then some of the Japanese territories directly north of there, in the Carolines, the Marianas, and the Marshalls, the British and the Gilberts. Here's Hawaii in the right where I'm circling the cursor, basically right in the middle of the Pacific. And then about a thousand miles from Pearl Harbor, where I have my cursor to the northwest, is Midway Island, almost on the international date line. It's named Midway partly because it's almost midway between one coast and the other in the Pacific. Now, one thing to point out just real quick, and, and this may be this is a whole other talk for a whole other time, but I will just point out when you think about the Pacific, just remember the vast distances that we're talking about here. The continental United States from New York to San Francisco is about 3,000 miles, give or take a little bit. So it's about 3,000 miles wide. 
San Francisco to Honolulu is 2,000 miles. Honolulu to Manila, which was at the time the Philippines were a U.S. colony, is 5,000 miles. So you can sink the continental United States with plenty of room to spare in the Central Pacific. And that's something to be borne in mind is when we think about the Pacific, never forget that this is a very large, large battle space. So that's your basic orientation to the theater here. Now, how do we get to the, to the battle in June of 1942? And let's look at the start of the war. Japan has decided um, through a, a variety of things, and some of you may have attended a presentation I did with, with uh, the Commemorative Air Force back in December, where we looked at the road to Pearl Harbor and why Japan goes to war. Um, so I will summarize it very briefly here. Japan has been bogged down in China. Um, they have been looking for opportunities to keep the war going. They're not interested in retreating. And as the war develops, and as the United States, Britain, and the Netherlands become increasingly hostile to Japan and begin to embargo the resources Japan needs to keep the war going in China, uh, Japan decides to seize by force this blue area, the southern resources area that has the resources that they have. And to do this, they decide to go after the United States, Britain, and the, and the Netherlands all at once. That's the genesis of the Pearl Harbor attack. And you can see what the Japanese will then do. They will, over the first five months of 1942, they will basically conquer the area that you see here in the solid red line, which ultimately will be one seventh of the globe. They'll conquer the Southern Resources area, force the British to surrender at Singapore, force the Americans to surrender at Bataan, and then later the entire Philippines after the fall of Corregidor. They'll move down into New Guinea, the Northern Solomons. They'll capture British colonies in the center, Wake Island, Hong Kong, the British colony in Hong Kong, the U.S. at Wake Island, the U.S. at Guam. They'll invade Burma and cut China off from its last land communication, cut the Burma Road. This is all done within five months. Um, and it's one of the, actually one of the great blitzkriegs in military history. It's how fast they go. And even the Japanese are surprised at how fast it all goes. So that's how we get to this. That, that's where we are in the spring of 1942. The Japanese tide has surged out from Tokyo and surged out from the home islands. And it is surging. And it has reached the area that you see here. Now, it's important to point out with the, with with a couple of exceptions where the Japanese have been temporarily stopped, specifically at Wake Island and Bataan, they have won. Everywhere that the Japanese have showed up, they've won. And before I explain a little bit further about that, I want to introduce the first two um, person, dramatic personalities, dramatic personality, if you will, on our stage today. This is the commander of the Combined Fleet and the man who has really driven a lot of the strategy that Japan has been following particularly in the U.S. or in the, the Japanese Navy, Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku. He is a veteran of the Russo-Japanese War, and if you look real carefully at his left hand in the lower corner of the, the uh, image, you'll notice he missed. he's missing two fingers. He was known as 80 sen among the geishas, because normally it's 100 sen to have your manicure done. But he's only 80 sen because he's missing two of his 10 fingers. He lost them during the Battle of Tsushima in May of 1905, uh, up to this time, the greatest victory in the history of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Had served in the United States, had done a couple of tours with the Japanese Embassy, had been involved in arms negotiations, studied in the United States, understood the Americans. He makes the famous comment at the very beginning, we will run rampant for the first six months. After that, I don't know. And he will real. He, he's, he's very much... Um, concerned about the latent power of the United States. Um, and that's one of the reasons he decides that Pearl Harbor is the operation to begin hostilities in the Pacific. But he is the key naval figure, commander of the combined fleet um, with its headquarters down outside of Hiroshima um, in the Japanese home islands. His counterpart in Honolulu is this man, who I argue is one of the greatest admirals the United States has ever produced, Admiral Chester Nimitz, who, uh, came to Pearl Harbor. In fact, Franklin Roosevelt uh, called him up after Pearl Harbor and said, and, and told the Secretary of the Navy, tell Nimitz to get out to Pearl Harbor and stay there until the war is won. He had taken command of the, the what's left of the Pacific Fleet on New Year's Eve, 1941, aboard a submarine. He's a former submariner himself um, and will command all the way through the rest of the war. He is a sink pack, so commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, 
and Commander in Chief of Pacific Ocean Areas. Um, extremely capable, great leader. Like I said, one of the greatest admirals this country will ever produce. And his leadership by the spring of 1942, he started to raid the Jap some of the Japanese uh, possessions and trying to be aggressive where he can, and hu but husband his resources until the situation clarifies a little more. He has something else in common with Yamamoto in addition to like positions. Um, he's also missing a finger. He's hiding his left hand because he had had a machinery accident early in his career, and his left ring finger had been had been severed. So, and you can see some pictures of him with only nine fingers showing. So that's an interesting little combination. But these are our our two key protagonists when you think about setting the stage for Midway. By the spring of 1942, as we've been talking already, the Japanese are debating what to do. They've basically achieved all of their objectives that they set out to do in the war faster than they had originally expected. And this has bred what is, is called later called victory disease. The thought, as we've already alluded to a little bit, that all the Japanese have to do is show up and they will win because that's what they've been doing for the last five months. And there's a debate in the Japanese high command, do we stop? and form a defensive perimeter to hold against the, the allies to counterattack, or do we press our advantage? And there's a lot of people that want to press their advantage. The question becomes, do you go east against the Americans, the supply lines to Australia, or New Guinea, or do you go west and hit the British and hit India, particularly because there's some possibility of revolt in India? Um, do you do that? They send the main carrier force of six carriers known as Kido Butai, we'll talk about them in more detail in a little bit, into the Indian Ocean in April of 1942, and they actually drive the Royal Navy from the Indian Ocean all the way back to the East African coast. So there is some success that happens there. So there's this debate that's going on as April of 1942 progresses. Into this debate, tremendous influence on this debate, as a matter of fact, comes this event on the 18th of April, 1942, when Jimmy Doolittle, along with 16 B, a force of 16 B-25s, raids Tokyo. And this is a picture of Doolittle's B-25 taking off from the carrier USS Hornet. And uh, it shocks the Japanese. Security of the homeland, security of the emperor is a prime consideration for many Japanese senior leaders, especially Yamamoto, who takes this personally. And any debate, which way to go, any debate like that changes immediately. It tilts the scales irrevocably in favor of what Yamamoto favors, which is to go east. And so Yamamoto's plan, which is summarized on this map, is adopted by the Japanese high command. Basically, where Solid line is where the Japanese are in the Pacific at this point. What Yamamoto's plan is, is to launch a series of operations. First, to go and secure New Guinea, Port Moresby on the eastern tip of New Guinea, secure the Coral Sea area, then turn and fight a decisive battle against the Pacific fleet here at Midway, and at the same time seize the Aleutians and the, uh, up at the western end of Alaska. Once that is done, push down into New Caledonia, and once the Americans have been defeated, obviously, push down into New Caledonia, Fiji, and cut Australia off from the U.S. West Coast. That's Yamamoto's plan. That is the strategy that is ultimately decided. And that is the strategy that will lead to the Battle of Midway. Now, I mentioned there's a first operation prior to Midway, and that is the invasion of Port Moresby here at Coral Sea. Two of Kido Butai's six carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku are detached to go and, and fight. And the U.S. sends uh, two task forces, one centered on USS Lexington and one centered on USS Yorktown to engage. And over two days, um, frankly, this map kind of looks like somebody threw spaghetti against the wall. But in two days, um, the Japanese will uh, be forced to call off the invasion. The United States will lose a carrier. They'll lose Lexington sunk. Yorktown will be damaged. Japanese will lose a carrier, carrier Shoho, the first ship larger than a destroyer that have been, has been sunk in the Pacific War to this point, first Japanese ship that is larger than a destroyer. But the big thing is, is that while the Japanese get the better end of the exchange in terms of relative losses, they are forced to call off the, the invasion of Port Moresby. And Port Moresby will never be taken by the Japanese. Here's the effect of that. This is the first 
Japanese strategic defeat. It is also a watershed in, in American and in world military history because it is the first ever naval battle where opposing ships never sight each other. The carriers do all the fighting by flying air raids against each other. So it's a preview of what we're gonna see off Midway. Here's the other thing that happens though, is it's interesting the reaction from both sides. And you see, this is a little bit of the victory's disease manifesting itself. Both sides have suffered damage. Shokaku was damaged during the operation. Zuikaku had lost a lot of air, a lot of its air group. Both of them are dropped from the Midway operation. Yorktown returns to Pearl Harbor. Chester Nimitz goes into the dry dock as, and inspects the damage and tells the yard captain, I must have her in three days. And she will be ready in three days to fight off Midway. That's Yorktown and dry dock there. She arrives May 27th. She leaves May 30th with workmen still aboard. They don't make her perfect, but they do enough to make her serviceable to get into combat, which she will do off Midway. But I want you to, if you want to, think later on the respective attitudes toward the upcoming fight off Midway, shown by how Nimitz regards Yorktown and how the Japanese regard their two carriers from Coral Sea. So what is the Japanese plan? This is Yamamoto's plan to both capture Midway, but also lure the Pacific Fleet into battle. He's got a large set of groups, and I'll give you some details on these later. The big thing you need to point, I need to point out is that you've got three main groups that, that are approaching Midway. First of all, you've got the invasion force with covering cruisers coming out of the Marianas, Saipan and Guam, approaching Midway from the southwest. Approaching Midway from the west is two groups. First of all, Yamamoto with the main body himself in battleship Yamato with two Nagato and Mutsu, the three most powerful battleships in the Japanese inventory at the time. And a day steaming ahead of them is Kido Butai itself. And we'll talk more about them here in just a minute. But it's worth pointing out that Kido Butai will be by itself for at least 36 hours off Midway before the rest of the main body shows up. Yamamoto is basically dangling it out as a lure for the Pacific Fleet to come out and then be destroyed by these masses of Japanese ships that will then close in and hopefully catch it by surprise. Simultaneously, the Japanese will invade Atu and Kiska up here and raid Dutch Harbor on June 4th. And you can see June 4th is when the first raids on Midway are supposed to take place. June 4th is when the first raids on Dutch Harbor are supposed to take place. And again, Midway to Pearl Harbor is about a thousand miles, just to give you some idea of where we are. Um, as a matter of fact, ge geologically, Midway is part of the Hawaiian Island chains. It's actually the westernmost island in the Hawaiian Island chains. Uh, but this is the main Japanese plan. It's actually kind of complicated, and the key factor is surprise and misdirection. That assumes, well, I'll get to that in a minute. These are the two leaders. I told you I was going to talk a little bit about Kido Butai. These are the two leaders that are going to be the key elements of the Japanese carrier force that lead vanguard, if you will, that we were just talking about. The guy on the left is Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, who has led Kido Butai since before the war. He's, he's arguably the most experienced carrier admiral in history up to this time. Kido Butai, when it raided Pearl Harbor with six carriers, and when it raided uh, British bases in the Indian Ocean with six carriers, those were both the largest carrier operations ever mounted up to that time and would not be exceeded in size until late 1943, early 1944. Nagumo, however, is, has become a very tired man. And some of his staff have noticed that many times he will simply approve their plans without worry. He relies very heavily on his staff. He trusts them. But at the same time, several of them will later admit that even they know that they can make uh, they can make mistakes. And there's some evidence that that months at sea since Pearl Harbor, had, they're dulling his mental edge. Taman Yamaguchi commands one of the two carrier divisions, Nagumo carry, commanding the other one directly. Um, and he commands one of the carrier divisions, and we'll talk a little bit more about them in just a minute. He is one of the rising stars in the Imperial Japanese Navy. He's considered an eventual success, successor to Yamamoto brilliant ca carrier admiral in his own right. Um, and these are the two kind of key leaders um, that are expected to fight the carriers off midway for the Japanese and will ultimately do that. This is the main Japanese fleet. 
I told you I was going to give you some details about the order of battle. Here's a little bit about it. You can see the main body we've already talked about with Yamamoto's bringing three battleships, a light carrier supports, Kido Butai. I'll give you some more details about that in a little bit. I, I, it's important to understand, uh, isolate that and understand that because we will, the United States will fight that in isolation. We'll get to that in a minute. Midway Occupation Force, these are the troops coming up from the southwest, the ships coming up from the southwest. You can see what they are there. Two battleships, eight cruisers, a light carrier, and then the Aleutians Force there as well. When you add all of the ships that are involved in this, it's over 250 and is the largest fleet ever put to sea up to that time and will not be passed until Task Force 58 in 1944. So this is a, if the Japanese are impressed with themselves, is what historians said once, um, it's because of that fact. And uh, it's worth pointing out here. The Japanese are bringing a lot of combat power to bear. Now, again, they're expecting to catch the Americans by surprise. This man ensures that the Americans won't. This is Joe Rochefort, who commands Station Hypo, the code-breaking station in Pearl Harbor. Um, at the Naval Station in Pearl Harbor. And he has been there. He and his people can read Japanese. They can, um, they, they are very conversant with the Japanese Navy, have broken the Japanese codes. And he will be another key, key actor on the stage in this drama that we're playing now. The Japanese are using the JN25 code. They normally are supposed to update it every quarter. As a matter of fact, it was supposed to be updated April 1st, but where was most of the Japanese Navy at the time? It was in the South Seas, and of course, Kido Butai was in India. Physically, you, you can't radio these code books. You have to physically tr take these code books out to the various ships wherever they're, dis they're dispersed. Because of delays in the press of operations, the update is delayed to May 1st and ultimately delayed to June 1st. That means that the Americans and Rochefort, who have broken the old Japanese naval code, can read Japanese messages. They can't read them perfectly, but between analyzing traffic back and forth and reading enough, particularly he uh, headers and things like that, they're able to figure out the basic outlines of a plan that I illustrated to you and that I explained to you a couple of slides before. But there's one thing initially they can't figure out because all the objectives are use the code letters AF. Washington thinks it's Oahu, Pearl Harbor. Rochefort is convinced it's Midway. And so he has Nimitz, he persuades Nimitz to tell Midway via undersea cable, by the way, so secure communications, broadcast, send out a message in the clear that you're having trouble with your uh, saltwater distillation plant. And so Nimitz does that, and they transmit it. Two days later, Rochefort's people de decode a message. AF is short of water, and that's the proof he needs. Nimitz decides he's going to accept battle off Midway and designates a point for his fleet to arrive northeast of Midway, which he designates Point Luck. In other words, he's going to try and ambush the Japanese. Instead of being surprised, he's going to try and surprise them by turn. Who's he going to commit? What forces are he going to commit? He's basically going to push all the available chips into the center of the table. The three available aircraft carriers, USS Enterprise and USS Hornet, part of Task Force 16, the Doolittle Raid Force, and of course the survivors of Coral Sea, Task Force 17, centered around USS Yorktown. Now, who's going to command this operation? The logical choice is this man here, William Halsey, who has been commanding the carrier force since before the war started and has led many of the raids and has led many of the active operations. It's, his, it's under his command that Jimmy Doolittle's bombers were taken to within range of Japan. Problem is, the stress of operations over the last few months and near constant stressful sea duty, Halsey has fallen ill. He's got a very severe skin rash and he's, he's, his health is broken tem temporarily, but his health is broken. He can't go. So who's gonna take command? These are the two key US leaders in the operation. The senior man is this man to the left, Frank Jack Fletcher, experienced admiral, um, not, a care, not an aviator, but nonetheless experienced admiral, had commanded Task Force 17, was the senior officer of President Coral Sea, um, it was the man who obviously brought Yorktown back, and he'll be the senior officer president. 
Halsey recommends his cruiser's commander, the man to the right there, Raymond Spruance. And there are a lot of people who say, why is he? He's not an aviator. How can he command carriers? By the end of the war, the Japanese will regard him as their most feared adversary among the American admirals, um, Raymond Spruance. And so he will take command of Task Force 16 on Halsey's recommendation. He'll inherit Halsey's staff too. Now, as we think about all this, one of the things I wanna emphasize, and this is why I, I mentioned at the beginning that for about 36 hours, the Americans are gonna be fighting just Kido Butai itself while the rest of the Japanese ships mass. And this is important. I want you to look at this, particularly when you think about this from an aviation perspective, look at what's available at the point of contact. You can see the Japanese will bring four carriers, two battleships, three cruisers, 248 aircraft. The United States will have three carriers, eight cruisers, 15 destroyers. But notice the amount of aircraft. And notice they have one, they, they have two, they have two advantages. The first is the number of aircraft. And we'll give you some, I'll give you some more details here in just a second. But the second is notice that last element, 127 on land. They have a fourth, if what is in effect, a fourth aircraft carrier, and that's Midway. And Midway, of course, cannot be sunk. So the United States has an advantage of surprise, but they also have an advantage of more aircraft, and they have advantage because one of their four flight decks, one of their four airfields, if you will, cannot be sunk. And so those are two key trump cards that Nimitz holds that will ultimately play a key role in the battle. Here's the quick thing on the aircraft strengths. I told you I'd break it down. Here's what I'll break it down to. You can see the relative strengths in each of the Japanese carriers there, Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu, and Soryu. And you can see the differences there. Each carrier, each U.S. carrier, carries more planes than a light Japanese carrier. And you can see the rough breakdown of the air groups. The fighters will be F-4, F-4 Wildcats with uh, um, TBD Devastator torpedo planes and Dauntless dive bombers. And then Midway, you can see, has got a mix of Army Air Force and Navy and Marine planes of various types, including Catalinas, which will provide essential um, reconnaissance during the battle. So this is our lineup as we start the drama. It starts actually on June 3rd because the Japanese, actually the first part of the Japanese fleet that is sighted is the invasion force coming up from the Southwest. PBY Catalina is spotted. There are bombing runs by the flying fortresses late in the afternoon, midway late in the afternoon. Um, you will notice, uh, or one of the things they learn is that uh, there's, it's very hard from level bombing from 20,000 feet to strike moving ships, particularly if those ships can then maneuver. Um, the several PBYs will launch a torpedo attack late in the evening, damage a transport, um, but nonetheless, the invasion force continues to move on. Um, so that, that's your opening round on June 3rd and why I say the battle starts on June 3rd. The morning of June 4th, the Japanese Kido Butai, which is coming in from the Northwest, here's Midway, right in the lower center, comes out of a front which had been kind of hiding it, cloud formations, and launches a dawn strike against Midway. They fly off 100 air, aircraft of different types and move in to attack Midway. And the raid will start at 6.40 in the morning here at Midway. Midway will, will figure this out. The radar tells them it's coming. Also, um, some of the PBYs will spot the Japanese and will report in just before 6 a.m. And so the commanders at Midway will launch every available aircraft and send them after the Japanese fleet. And so while the Japanese are, are trashing Midway, although Midway, they'll, they'll do damage, but they will ultimately, Midway will still be in the airplane business, um, there are, Midway's air group is going after the Japanese. And you'll notice the sequence of attacks. First, the air raid on Midway starts about 6.40, lasts about a half an hour or so. Um, about an hour after that raid, about 7.30 or so, the first of the American planes from Midway will approach the Japanese and will begin to launch a series of attacks. First, these six Avenger planes will attack, force the no, no hits, but they'll force the Japanese to maneuver, followed by four B-26s who will launch torpedo attacks. Three of them will be shot down. All torpedoes miss. One of the B-26s coming in is wounded, it's hit, 
and uh, either the pilot is dead or the pilot decides it's, he's going to try and uh, sell his life cheap, dearly um, and dives directly at Akagi's bridge, which is Nagumo's flagship. And at the last minute, it's just a degree or two off, buzzes the bridge. Some accounts actually have it hitting the deck and cartwheeling over the side. Either way, it's a huge near miss for Admiral Nagumo from this American B-26 bomber. And when you think about the human factor in this battle, uh, I don't know about you, but that would make me take pause, particularly seeing that kind of ferocity from my enemy, but at the same time having that kind of near miss. And then 27, shortly after that, hard on the heels comes uh, the glide bombers. They're, they're, they're not well-trained dive bombers at this point, um, but it's a, a Marine squadron under a major named Henderson. The Henderson Field on Guadalcanal will later be named for him because he and about half of his Marine flyers will be shot down trying to glide bomb against the Japanese. No hits, no hits at all. And then last but not least, shortly after Henderson's men go in, flying fortresses come over, drop bombs from high distance, get a couple of near misses. No effect, but you'll notice for about an hour, hour and a half, the Japanese are doing nothing but reacting to incoming American attacks. And that is to be borne in mind. Here's a picture of Akagi under air attack from one of the B-17s. That's to be borne in mind when you consider some of the other information that's coming in to Admiral Nagumo while the American planes are incoming and attacking his formation. First is a radio message from the commander of the Midway Strike, a, a lieutenant named Tomonaga. There is need for a second attack. At the same time, one of the scout planes from the cruiser Tone, which had started 30 minutes late from the rest of the scout planes and had just started on its inbound leg back from its search pattern coming back home, reports American ships. Ascertain ship types, reports no carriers, but ascertain ship types and maintain contact is the, is the, is the order. And about 15 minutes later, shortly after the B-26 near miss, it is reported that American, an American carrier appears to be bringing up the rear. Nagumo now has a, has a decision to make. He has just ordered his, but in response to Tomonaga's message, he had just ordered his, his planes below to rearm from, to, from torpedoes to bombs to bomb midway. They're about a third of the way through that. It'll take him about 45 minutes to do that. They're about a third of the way through does he stop that? Does he launch on Midway? Does he launch with what he has? What does he do? At the same time he's debating all this, the Midway strike force starts to return. There's some planes that are low on fuel. They've got some wounded. Um, there are a few that are damaged. It's gonna, it's going to take time. The question is, do you hit out with what you have now, which is actually not encouraged in Japanese doctrine. They prefer a full deck load strike combined arms, do you hit out with what you have, or do you reset and decide to launch something more full later? Yamaguchi adds his note into all this, and keep in mind, American attacks are progressing during all this. Urgent, advise launching strike force immediately. This seems to push Nagumo in the opposite direction, and he decides. But before doing this, and this is the human element as well, he turns to his air officer, Minoru Genda, and asks Genda what he should do. And Genda looks up and he will say, I believe we should land all aircraft. And he later admitted that this was a mistake. He said, I was thinking like a pilot. I was not thinking like a strategist. He knew many of those people up there. And he knew that some of them might go, might, might go into the water, run out of fuel, whatever if they don't come down. And he says, we, it was thinking like a pilot. But he makes, the, he rec makes that recommendation, Nagumo decides, bring everything down, rearm, prepare to strike the Americans, we'll strike them at 10.30. It's gonna take about 45 minutes to an hour to prepare this strike, get it on the deck, spotted, warmed up before the launch. That's time the Japanese will be, so, will be searching for, for a while. Nimit, or excuse me, Nagumo will also, at this point, recovering his strike in this area that you see here, the red line being the Japanese, the black line being the Americans. 
They'll then turn northeast, get away from Midway, but also start to close the distance toward the Americans. And you can see the dashed line here is Task Force 16. The solid line is Task Force 17. Spruance at seven o'clock in the morning will start his launch against the Japanese. There'll be some disorganization and ultimately it will end up being kind of a fan of aircraft from Hornet and Enterprise that will set off between 745 and eight searching for the Japanese. At about 8.30, Yorktown will launch a coordinated strike with, about ha with, with half her dive bombers and the rest of her uh, air crew as well, aiming for the Japanese over here. A lot of Hornet's air group will not get into action, but part of it will. And that part of it is the torpedo squadron. These are the three torpedo squadron leaders who happen to reach the Japanese fleet first. Eugene Lindsay is there to the left, commanding VT-6 from USS Enterprise. In the center is John Waldron, commanding VT-8 from Hornet, and then Lance Massey, commanding VT-3 from Yorktown. Waldron and his squadron will get there first. Waldron will actually have a disagreement with his uh, air commander, Stanhope Ring, and will basically tell him to buzz off and will steer a direct line. He's part Sioux, and somebody people have actually credited his part Sioux in the intuition. Took him right as one of his uh, one of his squadron pilots would say later, as if it was tied to a string. Took him right to the Japanese formation. At about 9:30 in the morning, about 15 minutes after the last of Tomonaga's aircraft have been recovered, more American planes are spotted inbound from the northeast, and this is Torpedo Eight. Followed shortly thereafter, about a half an hour later, by Torpedo Six. And then about 20 minutes after that by Torpedo 3. What happens? The Japanese are not caught unprepared. They have zeros as combat air patrol, and the zeros will dive down, coming out of the, coming out of this, the, the high, high altitudes of 14, 20,000 feet, will dive down as these low, slow planes have to fly low and straight, to drop their torpedoes, and uh, they will start to splash them, and they will start to splash these torpedo planes. Of these torpedo squadrons, precisely one pilot of the 30 pilots and air gunners of Torpedo 8 survived. That's George Gay. We'll talk about him a little bit more in just a minute. All but four of Lindsay's squadron, including Lindsay himself, are shot down. About half of Massey's squadron is shot down. They are supposed to attack with dive bombers above them and with fighter support, but they don't because they realize the stakes. These men all realize the stakes of the battle and they realize they have to do something even if it means the ultimate sacrifice. This has been called and as what somebody said, what is not luck, as Herman Wokes said once, what is not luck but is the soul of the United States of America in action is the willingness of these torpedo squadron bombers to go in and do the best they can. Waldron had told his squadron, he says, if there's one, if the last man, I want the last man to go in and get it in. And I love this painting, it's an evocative painting. This is George Gay um, and his, the last torpedo plane. He will fire a torpedo on one of the Japanese carriers, Soryu, and uh, will ultimately be shot down immediately after and will spend the next 15 hours hiding under a sheet, uh, seat cushion floating in the Pacific, hoping nobody sees him. He misses. The torpedoes that are launched by Lindsay's people miss. The torpedoes that are launched by Massey's people miss. But what do the Japanese ships have to do? They have to maneuver. They have to maneuver to get out of the way of these torpedoes. They have to turn quickly in many, in many cases, zigzag. They have to do a lot of different things. So the ship is, is moving back and forth. And if you've ever been on a large ship and it turns, turns suddenly, you realize how it heals a little bit. It's not a steady platform. Now imagine that you're Nagumo and his staff trying to make decisions in the heat of this battle. But more importantly, you're an armorer and a fueler below decks trying to get the strike ready. How well do you think you can do your job? The answer is not very well. And by 1030, the strike will not be ready. But by then, most of the planes will, despite everything, be prepared to come up. They'll be loaded and fueled and be prepared to come up on the deck as soon as the American attacks abate. 
But you'll notice the American attacks continue to come one right after the other. And so Keto Butai is not able to get into any kind of operational rhythm. And when you, th when you think about what it takes to arm, fuel, strike, or spot, and launch aircraft, even today, the operations of commemorative Air Force at events, think about how intricate that is. Now multiply that by many, many factors on these carriers and make them under attack. And you see what's going on. You see how these attacks are having a cumulative effect. Let's put two more characters on our stage. These are the dive bomber leaders here. Wade McCluskey to the left of, from Enterprise, Max Leslie from Yorktown, um, commanding Yorktown's dive bombers there to the right. McCluskey has been searching to the south of Kido Butai. He sees a Japanese destroyer, which has been hunting an American submarine, is racing to, a, to get back to the, form. it had been detached and had been racing to get back. And he realizes the wake is an arrow. And he says later, I followed the arrow. And so he will approach Kido Butai from the southwest at about the same time that Max Leslie, by sheer chance and luck, approaches from the northeast. And so these, Leslie's men will strike Soryu, McCluskey's men will strike Akagi and Kaga. And at 10.25, as Nagumo is waiting for his strike to be put on the decks, one of his staff officers will look up and yell, Hell Divers! Here comes the Americans. Here come the American dive bombers. Within five minutes, three of the best Japanese carriers, Akagi, Kaga, and Soryu, will turn into fiery infernos. The American bombs will go through the Japanese decks, explode among the, the fueled and, and, and armed aircraft, and very quickly in those enclosed spaces, well, you, you can imagine what happens in those enclosed spaces and how the fires and the explosions will leap and very quickly gut many of these ships. And uh, by 1045, the Soyuz captain is abandoned, says abandoned ship, um, and the other carriers are essentially doomed. They're certainly out of action. They will ultimately sink either that night or the next morning. In five minutes, five minutes, this happens. It is a tremendous turn of fortune and is something that is a testament to the skill and a little bit of luck of McCluskey, Leslie, and their pilots. Here you, of course, survives. And as the Americans are pulling away, Yamaguchi spots what, spots what planes he has and sends them after the Americans. And they actually follow planes back and they figure, well, we'll let them lead us right back to the carrier. And they end up going back to Yorktown, which they will hit right around midday. And this is how the Japanese leave USS Yorktown on fire. The Japanese believe Yorktown is done for. The fires are put out thanks to excellent damage control. The boilers are relit. And within an hour, Yorktown is making 18 knots and is once again resuming flight operations. The Japanese will rearm, come back, strike what they think is a second American carrier, which is again USS Yorktown, leave that carrier in this condition. This time Yorktown will not recover. The Japanese realize they've probably struck they, they think they've struck two carriers, knocked out two American carriers. Now it's one to one. This phase of the battle, Spruance is beginning to maneuver. Um, Fletcher has, has got his own problems with his flagship Yorktown. So Spruance is maneuvering Enterprise and Hornet to try and finish the job on June 4th and take out Hear You. Yamaguchi's looking to do the same thing. His pilots are exhausted. Many of them have been flying since four o'clock in the morning. So he takes a cup, takes an hour or so to give them rest. That gives Spruance enough time to get planes in the air and to go after Hear You. And late in the afternoon, they will strike Hear You. This is a photo of Hear You under air attack earlier in the battle. And this is what she looks like once USS Enterprise dive bombers are done with her. She is out of commission as well. And of all four Japanese carriers, all of them are on fire and are out of combat. They are, they're done. They are, they are out of commission. And they will all sink or be scuttled um, evening of June 4th or the beginning of June 5th. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. That night, Yamamoto digests the news from Nagumo. Fletcher says, tells Spruance, I will conform to your movements. And so it's basically Spruance's battle from this point forward. 
Yamamoto steams his ships forward, trying to get to a night action. Nagumo, who sends a panic message saying, I'm being pursued by five American carriers. Yamamoto relieves him at that point for basically, I think you've lost, you've lost the edge. Spruance fears a trap, turns around that night, and in the morning will be northeast of Midway once again. So he escapes the jaws that Yamamoto is trying to slam shut. Yamamoto, when he realizes this shortly before dawn on June 5th, will break off the action and begin to retire west, hoping to lure the Americans and try and spring a new trap. In the early morning hours of June 5th, here you will be scuttled by the Japanese. In the Japanese Navy, the Admiral, and definitely the Captain, and sometimes the Admiral, in this case Yamaguchi, declares himself personally responsible for the loss of Hiryu and Soryu and decides to go down with the ship. This is a painting of the ceremony where they take the, uh, the flags, they take the emperor's portrait and have a short ceremony uh, before everybody goes over the side. And Hiryu will be scuttled um, on, a, on, jet, on June 5th. Over the next two days, there's a cat and mouse hunt west of Midway during the maneuvers uh, two cruisers, Mogami and Makuma, will collide. Uh, they're heavily damaged, reduced in speed. Makuma will be left behind. Meanwhile, the Japanese submarine Yorktown remains afloat, trying to, trying to salvage her if they can. Um, submarine I-168 will sight Yorktown and will attack. This is the attack on Makuma on June 6th. This is probably one of the most famous photographs of Midway. Most people think it shows June 4th, action against the carriers. It does not. The smoke plume right here in the center is the, is the cruiser Makuma. She will be sunk with great violence, courtesy of, of planes from uh, Enterprise and Hornet, with Yorktown survivors involved as well. And then I-168 will torpedo the, the destroyer Haman, which is providing power and support to Yorktown. The Haman will break in half, sink with heavy loss of life, and Yorktown will be fatally damaged. And uh, on the morning, in the early hours of June 7th, 1942, with all flags flying, USS Yorktown CV-5 will roll over and sink to the bottom of the Pacific. But by this point, the Japanese realize that they are not going to lure Spurance into a trap. And so Yamamoto breaks off the action. This gives the Americans chance to re rescue survivors, among them George Gay, this is him actually 80 years ago yesterday in a Honolulu hospital. They've, they've worked on his left hand, you can see here. Most of the times when they've released this photograph, they crop out the bottom part where you can see the damage to his left knee. And I like to leave that in there because it shows the, the cost and it shows the damage that he's and what, what happened to him, the injuries that he survived. But they hauled him out of the water in a Catalina and he made it to a, a medical facility in Hawaii I asked him, how did you treat your wounds? He said, I soaked them in salt water for 12 hours. Uh, but it seemed to work. He will return to duty um, later and will we'll remain, in, remain in the Navy through the war. Uh, but that's old George Gay there getting rescued, the last man, the last survivor of John Waldron's Torpedo 8. Yamamoto breaks off the action and the battle by June 7th, June 8th, 80 years ago today. It's definitely over as both sides have disengaged. Here's the reckoning. You can see what the Japanese lose. 3,000 killed in action, all 248 aircraft, four carriers, one cruiser sunk. U.S. losses, 307 killed, 150 aircraft, a carrier, Yorktown, and destroyer, Haman, sunk. Japanese hush up this defeat. They do not want to talk about it. In fact, most of the crews, when they get back, are immediately sent to the South Pacific, are not allowed to contact their families because they don't want word rumors to even start. The Japanese air and the carriers never fully recover. It's not just the loss of aircraft and trained pilots, as many pilots are saved, but it's the loss of the carriers themselves, and it's also the loss of the technicians, the ground, what, what the, the land-based Air Force calls ground crew. Because remember, when you think about what it takes, even for the commemorative Air Force, you think about what it takes to maintain planes, it's not just the flight crew, it's not just the air crew, it's the mechanics, it's the administrative people, it's the armorers, it's all of that ground staff, all of those technicians, many of them die in those carriers. They are difficult to replace. 
And that, as much as anything, hurts the performance of Japanese naval air going forward for the rest of the war. The United States has an opportunity for an offensive. Of course, that will precipitate the Guadalcanal Canal and New Guinea campaigns starting in August of 1942 and lasting until the following February. Of course, the U.S. victory also allows the German war to go forward. Had Japan won, there might have been a, a incredible public pressure to turn all resources from the defeat of Germany, which is the Allied priority, to go straight after Japan. At no small detail, U.S. subs can set, use Midway as a fuel point as they go into the Central Pacific for the rest of the war, which saves them a thousand miles on the odometer. So that's something that should be borne in mind as well. That's the importance of this battle. Let me give you the last word, a couple of final thoughts before we open it for questions. John Toland wrote this in 1963. After the Battle of Midway, the crisis was over in the Pacific. The war here, however, would not turn into a simple parade of easy victories. The Allies would have to dig out a deeply entrenched and tenacious enemy in a series of costly battles of extermination. John Keegan in 1989, Midway was as great a reversal of strategic fortune as the naval world had ever seen before or since, and a startling vindication of the belief of the naval aviation pioneers in the carrier and its aircraft as the weapon of future maritime dominance. Both of these are absolutely right. And when you think about what we talked about at the beginning, this puts a fine point on this battle why it deserves study and why it deserves the stature that it does. If you'd like to know more, you want to read some, some further reading, here's some suggested titles for you. Um, I will uh, leave that up for just a second for you to digest those. Real quick commercial about the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. We actually commemorate some stories from Midway, some Wisconsinites in Midway. You're welcome to, to find us. Just Google us, if nothing else, but you can find us on Facebook and YouTube as well. I'm sure, Steve, you don't mind the short commercial. No. Uh, and with that, I will throw it back to you. I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. I look forward to your discussion or your questions. And Steve, I'll throw it back to you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I, it's, uh, I, a lot of those elements of, of the battle I've, I've known, uh, but there's some, some new information, as always, that uh, you've been able to, to uh, bring to us. Uh, but let's, uh, let's get some of our audience questions. Uh, Robert is asking, um, uh, he's recently questioned why Nimitz didn't have the Saratoga after being repaired, um, not leave San Diego on May 26th, that could have made it to Pearl Harbor about the 30th and then set sail for Midway. Everything I've seen from Midway is he, or excuse me, from uh, about this is that he would have loved to have had Saratoga, but they could not try as they might. They could not get her ready okay. in time. She was actually, she was actually about 24 hours too late to the battle. She gets to Hawaii on June 7th. So now, had the battle progressed, she would have been available. And I will point out, at this time of the war, you can always tell what carrier squadrons are assigned to because their squadron number. Is the home equals the home number. So you notice some of the air groups from Saratoga are involved with Yorktown. You saw VT3, Fighting 3, those are Saratoga flyers that are flying from Yorktown. So indirectly, USS Saratoga gets involved. But she, she physically, as much as they try, she can't get they can't get her ready to have her available. All right. Is, was there, uh, Bob uh, was wondering if there is uh, something that got the Japanese attacks out of sync between the Aleutians and Midway? And uh, did that have much of an effect uh, on the Battle of Midway? It, it, it's something that actually is kind of a misnomer. A lot of, a lot of accounts of Midway will, will paint the Aleutians as a diversionary action. It's actually not. Um, there's the, the book Shattered Sword really delves into this deeply. And I've, I've seen some other sources that really look at the Japanese sources. The Aleutians was its own operation. And it was, they, they were designed to unfold simultaneously. And there was never an expectation on the Japanese side that the raid on Dutch Harbor was supposed to lure Nimitz out. What was supposed to lure Nimitz out from Pearl Harbor was the attack on Midway. Okay. So the Aleutians is its own thing. And in fact, the, the Naval General Staff and the Imperial General Headquarters have kind of foisted it on Yamamoto saying, we need to do something about the Lend-Lease route to the Soviet Union mm -hmm. through the Bering Straits and through the, you know, around the Kamchatka Peninsula. So we need to take the Aleutians. And so it's kind of, 
the price of doing midway, you also have to do this at the same time. So that's, that's what some of the scholarship over the last 10 or 15 years has really developed by looking at the Japanese sources, which are increasingly trans, uh, available in translation. Now. Uh, why did the American bombers from Midway not have fighter support? I'm assuming that's just because they didn't have any aircraft there. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Um, if you're talking about the B-17s, they didn't yep. need them. Um, but if you're talking about the other ones, the the fighters that they had on Midway were the old Brewster Buffaloes, mm -hmm. which by this point are flying death traps. In fact, some of the pilots that were flying Buffaloes over Singapore would later say that anybody that orders you up in a Brewster Buffalo against zero should be court-martialed. So, you know, this is kind of the last hurrah for the Brewster Buffalo. And because of it, and because it's better, as they, they view it as, well, we can use its limited capabilities better defending midway as combat air patrol mm -hmm. will do that that's the better use for these aircraft and and, yeah. and again to, to put it as as you did when you started put it in historical context the u.s was still the arsenal democracy was still coming online it was mm -hmm. there were not a lot of aircraft that were being uh built and once you get them built then you have to get them to either uh to europe or to the pacific and, and it's just a basically supply chain <laughs> exactly that's, that's exactly yeah. right yeah yeah uh, uh bruce is asking um in what he's been reading current wisdom says the uh, japanese carrier had a relief combat air patrol spotted and ready to launch when the sbds started their dive uh what's your take on that that is true that is it true is. that's okay. one of the things that um shattered sword i rec really recommend that book okay. particularly in, in in this audience with their interest in aviation um, they spend a lot of time, it's fascinating looking at rel the relative carrier operations and doctrine and things like that. But one of the things that they have been able to do using some of the translated Japanese sources is figure out using the air group reports when the combat air patrol was going up. And that's how they're able to figure out that the strike force wasn't on deck is because you can't put your, you can't cycle fighters through if you've got all these other planes on deck. And that's one of the things they've determined is that each, because the Americans do say they spot planes on deck. But usually what what we what they figured out, and I know a couple of the guys who wrote that book, and, and what, what they figured out is it's the combat air patrol. There was usually, uh, each, each carrier had anywhere from up to a half a dozen air uh, zeros that were just waiting to take off. And there's that famous account of one of the American bombs landing among the planes as, as one of them's taking off and blowing it across the front. That was probably a combat air patrol fighter, particularly as the dive bombers are coming in. The carrier air boss is saying, get get up, get up now. Go. So it's going down the deck and the American bomb hits, it goes over the side. That's where that account comes from. All right, uh, Khan is asking, uh, in your opinion, why didn't Yamamoto just invade Midway and entrench a force there? Just simply because they couldn't safely resupply troops uh, given the long distance or was actually holding Midway never part of the objective? They wanted to take Midway. They wanted to hold okay. it. As a matter of fact, the guys that end up getting defeated by the Marines at uh, the Tanaru River in August of 1942, um, the Achiki Detachment, as they're known, was the Midway Invasion Force. They were sent to Guadalcanal because they were the most handy because they, they were assembled. They didn't have a mission anymore. Um, so they did intend to take Midway. The thing was, Yamamoto, um, he did the shock, the physical shock of losing the carriers. They talked about how his physical reaction um, and how he, he had just, the, the, he, had a, he had stomach problems from it, the nerves. It's almost like the shock of what had happened. It was difficult to... There was as a historian that talked about how in some battles there's a time for dash. You know, when the situation's going wrong, there's somebody will often grab the flag metaphorically and say, let's go. And the time for that dash, as he said, would pass in the Japanese side once those four carriers were knocked out. There were admirals that, want, that said, hey, let's go to Midway, let's surround it with battleships and let's bomb it. Let's just bombard it and, and you know, wipe it off the map and take it anyway. But Yamamoto. You know, quite frankly, having seen what American air power would do to his carriers, do I really want that to happen to the battleships? 
which at the time he still considered to be kind of the core of the fleet. All right. Um, Bob asks, um, and I, I think you may have mentioned this uh, in the beginning, but uh, he says the B-17s from Midway reported uh, hitting the ships, but actually didn't. But what was the effect on the Japanese of just the attack, not uh, with no damage? The the big thing about it is uh, the Japanese Japanese realize the Americans some of those near misses are a lot closer than the Japanese are, are comfortable with, that it's better bombing than what they're used to from Allied planes up to this time. Uh, particularly if you look at what the British how bad the, the British the Blenheims against the Japanese fleet in the Indian Ocean were not weren't doing what the B-17s did. Um, the B-26s seem to have quite an impact. When the B-20, the, the story about the, that's why I dwelt on that. Uh, that seemed to have quite an impact. And the ferocity with which the Americans are pressing all of their attacks is not something, and as you see it in several Japanese accounts, they're not used to seeing that from their opponents. And that, that has to have an impact. You know, when you go in, when you go in expecting A and you get B, that has to that has to have a mental impact. Uh, Art and hmm, this is a good good trivia question here uh, from uh, Flying Fortress RC. Uh, are there any Midway aircraft that survive today? Ooh, yeah, I have to look that up. <laughs> there are there are there's one at the Pensacola at the Naval Aviation Museum in okay. Pensacola. And if you go to O'Hare, you know, if you go to Midway Airport in Chicago, they've got a Dauntless. It's painted like one of the Dauntlesses in the battle. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. I want to say it is from the battle, but I, I'm not 100% sure. But if you ever fly through Midway Airport in Chicago, it's actually got a really nice display on the battle. Yeah. Uh, did the U.S. ask uh, Britain to send any of their carriers from uh, Madagascar to assist at Midway? No, it was too far. And, and the British carriers had their own, they had their own things that they had to deal with, but uh, it was, it was entirely too far. Now in 44, Saratoga, getting back to that other question, will end up with the, with the uh, British Far Eastern fleet for a while operating in the Indian Ocean. So it actually works the other way two years later. Okay. But what, yeah, the Americans are fighting with what they have on hand. All right. Um, uh, Bill is asking, as the uh, recovery from Midway continued, rather than adopting the island hopping campaign, were there any plans to go directly to Japan uh, from the U.S. side? I've never seen it. If there are, I've never seen it. The Navy had considered all through the famous War Plan Orange war games at the Naval War College and stuff like that. And basically what it came down to was... Um, Invading the home islands was a, would be a very difficult nut to crack. Part of it was logistics, because the closest land to the Japanese home islands was Midway. And that's several thousand miles. And that's not enough, there's not enough land on Midway to stage an invasion. When you consider all the bases that they conquered, the Philippines, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, the Marianas, to support an invasion of the home islands, you really need to get across. And the other thing too is where's the the beating heart? What's what's the resources that are keeping the Japanese going? It's in Indonesia. So if you push across the Pacific, you retake the Philippines, you cut the Japanese head off from the resource area that's the body. And then you can turn on the home islands and, and strangle them to death, which is ultimately what happened. Mm -hmm. You can't, it, doing it in one leap without those intermediate bases, it's, it, it's the same reason the Japanese never seriously considered in December 1941 invading Oahu when they struck at Pearl Harbor. They just, logistically, it was just not possible to transport an army and then sustain that army for a battle ashore across those kind of distances without bases in the, in the, in the, along the way. All right. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, would assigning a carrier as uh, combat air patrol um, and others uh, as the attacks went on would have helped? Would that have helped the Japanese get into action faster? And he's referencing a, a shattered sword uh, comment that you made. Uh, the short answer is yes. They okay. do some of that later in the war. There are some doctrinal changes in 43 that you'll see 
in use in the in the Philippine Sea in 44. The United States does the same thing. The duty the duty carrier for the day in Task Force 58 and things like okay. that in 44. Those are th the thing that the thing that I would encourage people to think about because there are a lot of controversies the Jap you know about the Japanese search patterns single phase versus two phase and all this stuff. Keep in mind carrier operations are still a brand new thing. You know, the, the largest air raid prior to Pearl Harbor was the, the British raid on Taranto with just a few mm -hmm. dozen aircraft um, in November 1940. So the uh, carrier operations, particularly after the, as the battleships are becoming eclipsed as the centerpiece of your fleet, people are still learning and they're writing the doctrine as they go. That's why, that's why I dwelt on Coral Sea, why it's such a landmark, is all of a sudden it's like, well, how do we fight if we don't actually get in gun range of the enemy? Yeah. You know, and so when you look at like the Guadalcanal campaign, you look at some of the raids in 43, you can see the Americans in particular learning, testing, figuring this out. So that by the time they get into the 44, the Marshalls, truck, Marianas, all the way to Leyte, you know, it's a well-oiled machine. And that's something to be borne in mind when you think about these battles is, is they don't know what we know about the future right. of carrier operations right up to today. And that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Thank you, John, for that, uh, that question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the Japanese leaders hid the results of the battle from uh, Japanese public? Uh, strict censorship. Yeah. Um, I've already talked about what they did with the, the personnel to avoid. The other thing they did was they, um, the, the Naval Register, you know, they do the register of all the ships that are on the, on the roster. And they provide that to the legislature. They provide that to the high command and all this stuff. They struck Kaga and Soryu, but they left Akagi and Hiryu on there for another six months in unmanned status. So they weren't officially gone. They weren't officially lost, at least in the corner of the Japanese. And then, you know, they destroyed records. That's one of the things that um, there's a lot of those records that were burned after the war. Um, you know, a lot of that trying to hide what had happened. Um, you know, one of the few things they were, that is reported, there's one story and it's our, it talks about our suicide method of cutting the enemy's, of cutting, of breaking the enemy's bone while we let him cut our flesh. And that's how they, that's how the, the Tokyo newspaper, Asahi Shimbun, summed up Midway. And then there's never any mention of it ever again in the media. So that's how they, I mean, it's, it's a very much a cone of silence that goes over what happened. Uh, Lance Hill is asking, uh, how did the uh, U.S. submarine fleet, uh, how was that utilized during the battle? U.S. submarine fleet is scouts, um, and then they are kind of spotting the Japanese, trying to be kind of a tripwire. The only one that really, there are some that cite the Japanese here and there, but the only one that really gets into action is USS Nautilus, which launches a couple of attacks, ineffective, largely due to the ineffective torpedoes that they that are armed with at the time. But it's the Nautilus is the Nautilus's great contribution is actually failing to attack and then getting depth charged, because Nautilus is the submarine that's being depth charged by that destroyer Arashi. Arashi has suppressed the submarine and is now returning to the formation, and up above Wade McCluskey spots the destroyer. So indirectly, that's probably the greatest contribution of the silent service to to the victory of Midway. That's amazing, and. Going all the way back to your, your very first, one of your very first slides, uh, the, the Japanese high command uh, debate between east and west and and whether to go, whether to go east uh, toward Midway or the other way. If, and it's pure speculation here, if the Doolittle Raid had not happened, uh, if instead of launching the 800 miles out in, and they would just said, no, this isn't going to work, we're going to turn around and go home. Right. Do you think they, the Japanese would have gone the opposite direction and tried to head toward uh, you know, Indochina and India? It was a real option. And I've seen, um, I, I recently published a book on the China, Burma, India campaigns of 43, 44. And I look at this question early in the book. There were plans in the Japanese army out there, the Burma area army to invade India called Plan 21. And the idea was they knew that the, that, that the Congress party, Gandhi and Nehru, there was a lot of unrest. In fact, it'll be called what's called the Quit India Movement in the summer of 1942, 
um, to get the British out. And the Japanese realized there's an opportunity here. And the Indian Ocean raid was kind of a step in that direction. And there were a lot of people in the Imperial General Headquarters that were saying, let's go back. Let's go back with an expeditionary force and hit the British, hit them in India. We'll then strangle China because there's no way you can keep China supplied because of the Himalayas and the geography. India will fall to us with all of its resources, and the British Empire may, between, between losing Singapore and then having serious damage in India, may very well collapse. And that was, that was, a, real, that was a real option that was a very much on the table. And Jimmy Doolittle obviously tipped the scales in the other direction. All right, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of good questions tonight. Um, were the great, yeah. yeah. Were the uh, SBDs so successful because the Japanese fighter defense was pulled down, responding to all the previous attacks? The short answer is yes, but there's also a couple other factors affecting the Japanese fighters. The first one is the Japanese don't have radar, so okay. all of their sightings are visual. There's also no central fighter direction, so the fighters are kind of doing their thing, attacking targets of opportunity. So the combat air patrol, in contrast to later in the war, is not very well organized. And so it actually gives, it's not just being low, but it's also not covering the sky as well as they should or having the radar to, ve to be vector. And so that actually, as much as anything, gives, though you put all those factors together and that's why McCluskey and Leslie are able to set up their attacks and a lot of times, you know, that, that, that account I used, the first time Nagumo realized dive bombers were coming in on him was when one of the staff officers looked up and, and started yelling. That should tell you something about the Japanese combat air patrol and air defenses. Uh, the Japanese tendency to split forces, uh, did that contribute to their defeat? Um, I was wondering if the main body had been present with the carriers, their additional anti-aircraft fire might have been more successful in defeating the dive bombers. I think that's true. Okay. Um, Yamamoto, and that's why I had that slide in there at point of contact, mm -hmm. is because for all of this force, Yamamoto frittered his strength away, and you know what's the what's the line? Quali quantity has a quality all its own. So if you show up with a large fleet, you know, that would make a huge difference. To say nothing of having battle a lot of battleships with you that you can put out front and not only raid midway with your planes, bombard. You know, and you know, that those some of those battleships, you know, ranges of 20 miles or more, you know, and midway's not midway's an easy target to hit. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't move. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, Midway, Yamamoto did himself no favors with his, uh, thankfully, from an American perspective. Yeah. But that's the overconfidence. That's the overconfidence. All we got to do, the Japanese mentality, that victory disease, all we got to do is show up and we'll win. Yeah. We've done it for the last five months. Uh, yeah, Leah's just reporting to us that uh, there's a quite a lively conversation of historians taking place on YouTube and Facebook tonight, <laughs> along with what we're talking about here. Uh, let's see, there was, uh, oh, Robert had uh, any information on why the PBY that sighted the Japanese fleet didn't stay around the area and continue on its scheduled search? The understanding I have is that it's chased off by combat air patrol. Okay. Yeah. That would probably be a good reason. Yeah, that is a good reason. And it's yeah. the same thing. It happened to the Japanese, too. The Japanese got chased off by American combat air patrol um, after they, those contact reports had been made. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, you had stated earlier that uh, Carl C. was the first battle fought without uh, sight of the combatants, uh, and he was thinking of the Japanese carrier sinking of the uh, HMS Hermes. Um, was that the first battle where the combatants were truly out of sight of each other, or is Carl C. the first one? You know, I was wondering, as I heard this question unfold, I was like, I wonder if there's going to be an uh -oh. Indian Ocean. <laughs> that, that's, that's an, it, it, I'll give you a historian's answer, Steve. It depends on how you score it. Okay. Because Hermes, the, the Hermes was not actively, Hermes was not fighting the Japanese. Hermes was trying to get away. Okay. They got caught and sunk. 
um, April April 1942 in the part of the Indian Ocean Raid. For those of you who may be wondering what we're talking about, um, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a one on one engagement like Coral Sea, where you have two groups of aircraft carriers actively trying to kill each other. In this case, Hermes and her escorts were trying to get away, okay, rather than get caught in port at, in in uh, in Sri Lanka, Ceylon. Um, I can see, though, why you might say that. Um, again, it depends on how you score it. <laughs> there you go. And it's, it's, here's a really good question. We'll, we'll finish with this one. Uh, if the Japanese had taken Midway, what would they have done next? Actually, the, we know what they would have done next, is they would have gone after Fiji, and they would have gone after American Samoa. They already had those plans um, on the on the books, and those would have been August September 1942. The idea, remember that map I showed you. The idea was was to take Midway, neutralize the, Amer the American Pacific fleet, what's left of it, the carriers, and then you go in, you go southeast from the Solomons. And the reason you do that is to cut the supply chain for Australia and the West Coast. And people forget already down there. There is the Americal Division the 1st Marine Division, and there's a couple other Army formations that are already garrisoning those islands and are moving toward those islands. So the Japanese want to solidify that defense line, basically from Fiji all the way to the Aleutians through Midway, and then you know, see what the Americans do after that. That's what they would have done. There was some initial talk about possibly Hawaii after that, but obviously overcome by events. So very true. Before we uh, sign off tonight, uh, you mentioned Burma, and you have a, a book that came out in, in March, and give you an opportunity to, to put in a plug for the book. Thank you for that. Yeah, and it's called Na Let's see if I can do this. There you go. It's called Nations in the Balance, and it's the uh, it's a look at the 1943-44 China Burma India campaigns, which have quite an air power component to them. The flying over the hump, infall and Kohima battles with the airlift there, Merrill's Marauders. Um, and, and all, you know, all those related operations. Um, but it, it's the decisive year of the war in, uh, on the Asian continent. And these events still have an impact politically and geopolitically today in that part of the world. Um, it's available on Amazon. It's available on it, wherever good books are sold. Um, Nations, in the, Nations in the Balance is, uh, and I'm really, really proud that this is out. Thank you for that. Yeah, sounds like it might be a, a topic for a, a future webinar. I'd love to do it. <laughs> well, good. Well, we'll keep that in mind. And uh, we're just going to wrap things up uh, here tonight. Thank you for uh, for sticking with us for a little overtime, but uh, a lively discussion. Thank you all for uh, for joining in. Uh, and and uh, even if you didn't join in with a question, thank you just for uh, for uh, being one of our uh, observers tonight. Uh, you know, don't forget to click that like, subscribe, uh, or follow button so we can let you know about future shows. And if you're on YouTube, make sure you hit the little bell and you'll get uh, notifications when we go live or when new uh, content is posted up to the uh, CAF media site. Uh, if you have an idea for a topic you'd like to hear more about, send Leah Black an email at media at CAFHQ.org. Thanks, Chris, for uh, sharing your thoughts tonight on the Battle of Midway. It was uh, always, as always, a fascinating uh, presentation, and, and thank you for, uh, for sharing your insights with us this evening. Thanks for having me, Steve. Always fun to get together. All right. Until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night. <laughs>